welcome. Um, today is our um, is a, a group discussion. Um, I and, and a little bit of a lecture on applying a gender lens to development. We have uh, Hallie Tufan, who is joining us from um, Turkey. She is a uh, and an adjunct assistant professor, professor in plant breeding, and is the project director of GREAT. The acronym stands for Gender Researchers Equipped for Agricultural Transformation. Um, this is a joint program between Cornell and McCrary University in Uganda, uh, with goals of establishing a center of excellence uh, for gender and agricultural research. Uh, training of researchers in this field and establishing a community of practice um, on gender and agricultural research. Um, also, Holly is the director of AWARE, and that acronym stands for Advancing Women in Agriculture Through Research and Extension. And I'll let her or Devin uh, describe that in more detail. We also have here Devin Jenkins who is the project manager for both GREAT and AWARE here at Cornell. Um, he has a background in community development and agriculture, uh, both in the United States and in West Africa, where he served two stints in Peace Corps, one in Benin and the other in Niger, is that correct? Um, and he's also got his MPS um, here in international agriculture and rural development. Um, Carol is not actually going to be speaking, but I wanted to introduce her as well. We also have Carol Colfer here, uh, who's also a gender uh, specialist. She's a visiting scholar in the international programs, uh, Southeast Asia program, and worked for C4, the uh, Center for International Forestry Research in uh, Bogor, Indonesia, for many years in gender and, and such. And she has a background in anthropology. So I think without taking too much more time, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Good morning, everyone. We're having a talking heads version of the seminar today. So <laughs> hoping it all works out. If you have any questions, we'll have to use the mic. So just ask Devin and he can pass you the mic during the presentation. Um, so as thank you, Julie, for the introduction. I'll be providing a little bit of background. We thought we should cover some material on gender development and why that's important and give maybe a case study to see how that's applied in, in practice. So brief overview, I'll give some terminology because I think it's important that everyone's on the same page in terms of what we're talking about and it helps to understand the debates a bit better. We'll talk a little bit about why gender is important in development, a specific focus on agricultural development, and then look at a small case study where I've been involved in leading some work on cassava breeding and gender. And then Devon will end with a description of great. So a little bit of lingo. Um, you have probably hear gender, you hear sex, and the first thing that we try to distinguish is how are those different, because that's quite important. Um, sex is defined basically before birth, genetically, and it, it's a difference between males and females. So it's biologically defined, and it just separates males and females, and males and females can be independently described from each other. The definition is the same around the world. The female is a female biologically in Uganda, as a female is a female biologically in the US. Gender, however, is really learned differences between men and women. They're culturally and socially defined. So these are not determined at birth, they're learned over time. And men and women really, it's a description that is a relationship. So it's a relationship between men and women, it's a reference to a social cultural relationship. And definitions of men and women really vary from place to place and even over time. So what it meant, to be a woman in 1950s in the US may be different from what it means in 2017, or what it means to be a woman in Uganda may be different from what it is in the US. So there's a place-based difference, time-based difference, and the really important thing to remember is gender is fluid. It's not fixed, whereas sex really is. And that's where we talk about gender and development as an opportunity to kind of improve women's lives, for example, because those concepts and norms don't have to be fixed. A few more words that I'll be using around the presentation that I thought would be good to describe, and one is gender roles. And these are really the behaviors, tasks, and responsibilities that are seen as being appropriate for women, men and women, and they're defined by cultural norms and beliefs. So 
a woman should do this, a man should do that, those kind of cultural norms that define different roles that men and women occupy. And the relationships between men and women are really called gender relations. And these are also shaped by social beliefs and institutions. So how should a woman and man interact with one another? How, how are those hierarchies defined? That's also very place-based and time-based as well. And because we're having a, a case study on gender responsive research, I've defined that as well. How does this all apply to really research and development? Well, if you want to be gender responsive, what that really means is you consider the differences in needs, constraints, responsibilities, and priorities of men and women when you design and implement projects. And lastly, this is one that also gets confused a lot. We talk about gender equality and gender equity. So this is a great graphic that I thought we could just include. So on the left, you have three people or three children standing on boxes and gender equality in this definition is this left-hand box. So everyone is given the same support but they don't necessarily start from the same place. So if you're shorter than the person on the left, the person on the right is quite short, they still can't see over the fence to watch the game. So it doesn't matter if you give everyone the same opportunities, it doesn't, it doesn't end up giving the same outcomes. Equity on the other hand is the middle panel, where if there's a historical injustice that you have to spend a little more time compensating for that. So the person, the child that's shorter can be given two boxes, for example, so then now they can see over the fence. I think it's a really nice visual representation of that difference. So even if you give different supports, they are being, they are being treated equitably. So they have equal access to what's being offered. Really the ideal goal in development is the right-hand panel where you have no barriers. <laughs> so basically that's when we talk about a systematic barrier, especially for gender equity has been removed. So everyone has equal access and benefits. That's the ultimate goal. So a little bit of a three-slide a three slide history on gender development, so we don't take too much time. Um, concepts change a lot over time, and gender development has done so as well, so I'll spend a little bit of time tracing that. The background panel here is, gen this is the Sustainable Development Goal number five. This is the reiteration of the Millennium Development Goals, which is on gender equality. So how do these concepts get defined in development, and what does that mean? Gender and development really has been around for a long time. It's not a new debate. Um, I guess it was really mainstream in the 70s when it was realized that development efforts really were marginalizing women. Women were being excluded and discriminated, discriminated against in development programs. There was this idea that women be, were being left behind while men were being prioritized and becoming more market oriented, more modern. So the UN declared the de decade of women, 1975, and what happened was then there was a lot of interventions targeted specifically at women. But what that did is it further isolated women because it didn't consider the context in which they lived and worked. So it may have had negative consequences, in fact. As the thinking evolved a little bit more in the 80s and the 90s, what happened is we got this concept of gender and development. So not just women, but gender and development. And this, some of you may have heard of the 95 World Conference on Women in Beijing was really a turning point for that. Well, now we're started looking at power relation and social injustice. So how do we empower women? How do we give them more agency within the context in which they live and work? And how do we consider that across development programming in design and implementation? And this is what we call gender mainstreaming. So if you ever see that word, it just means considering gender across design and implementation of projects and programs. And one slide, of course, is not enough to capture what's happening now. Um, but in the present, there's also a lot of things changing. There's some focus on women's economic empowerment, inclusive development. So kind of a more complex picture and realizing that you can't only focus on women. You need to bring men and children and youth on board. And even women are very different from one another. So you have to consider that. It's become a more complex picture. Looking at gender-based constraints, integrating gender into research again, gender and assets is a big debate going on, gender and value chains. But in terms of a, a bottom line, there is a lot of donor pressure on projects and programs, especially in agriculture, to really consider gender, which is good. But by and large, sex disaggregated data, which means data looking at men and women separately, where you can really start seeing gaps and differences and addressing those, is still not very common. So we need to change that culture a little bit. There's some drivers to do that on big data, for example. And even though there's still claims of participation and benefits, gender is still an add-on. 
and people define this as add gender and stir. So there's a project, they add a little bit of gender, and they say, okay, we've addressed it, but it still remains superficial. And if you want to know more about gender and development, there's actually a class on campus. I thought if you'd be interested, Development Sociology 3020, Gender and Global Change. So if you're interested in taking a semester long class about it, there are resources on campus. So specifically in agricultural development, because that's what this course really looks at, why does gender matter in agricultural development specifically? Well, it's pretty well documented that there's a gender gap in agricultural development. And what does that mean? Even though women, this graph just shows the proportion of women who are economically active in agriculture, you see that even that's up to 50% or women form a sizable portion of the economically active workforce, and that's increasing. So there's a feminization of agriculture. And yet, women only receive 5% of all extension services. So they're really lacking in information, they're lacking in new technologies because they're not reaching them. There's still a gap in terms of what women have access to knowledge and services, extension agents and by large men, and only 10% of all aid for agricultural, forestry, and fishing goes to women specifically. So even though they're there and they're 50% of the workforce, they're not benefiting to the same amount as men have been. A big issue is land rights. And this is a graph that I think that shows that quite nicely is most land holdings are held by men. And that creates a big problem because if you don't have rights over the land that you're farming, your incentives to kind of invest in that land or have decision-making power over it are very slim. And that's by and large across the world. So as a result, I mean, even though farming has a woman's face, women have had traditionally less access to resources than men. And that's very well documented. Here's some examples I put here. For example, yields can be less. Even in the same country, similar um, environments, women's fields yield less because they usually have less access to inputs. In Tanzania, for example, 87% of the land is, is managed by men, and very little is managed by women. And men's plots are larger. And even for um, ICT, this is the ICT revolution, and women own mobile phones less, so they have access to less information and less new technologies. And they're less likely to have formal bank accounts, so that kind of restricts the credit that they can receive, for example. All of these are what we call gender-based constraints. And that, what that refers to is restrictions on women, men and women's access to resources based on their gender roles and responsibilities. So this includes looking at disparities like we just did in the previous slides. What are the difference between men and women? So looking at that difference in land holding or access to knowledge, for example, but also identifying factors that cause those conditions. For example, a general constraint can be something like smallholder farmers all have small land holdings. They all have limited range to finance and credit options. They have limited ranges to access and market information, and that's true for men and women. But for example, for women, laws and customs may restrict women's lands ownership, or bank policies may require that they have their husband's signature to receive credit. So that's a constraint that's specific to women because she's a woman, and that's a gender-based constraint. And social norms may also limit their networking abilities. Some women cannot be as mobile as men. They're restricted in riding bicycles or moving autonomously in some cultures, or just inequitable distribution of household income. So why does that matter? Um, because basically the yield gap, and this is production gaps basically, if you only look at agricultural production, is about 20 to 30% between men and women. But if we gave equal access of resources to men and women, we could close that gap and you'd get about two and a half to four percent increase in um, crop yields and also production. And what that means is you would really take 100 to 150 million people out of poverty. So these are quite large numbers and it doesn't take that much to, to do what we need to do basically. For example, in Uganda, the gender gap as defined in a recent report is 13%. And if you close that gap, you get almost 3% increase in production, millions of increases in GDP, and 120,000 people lifted out of poverty. And what that also means is women are, are very well documented to reinvest more in their families. So if you increase a woman's income, it's the same as increasing a man's income if it's $10 to $110, for example because a woman will reinvest in the nutrition of, and health of the household. So just investing in women doesn't only increase, improve their lives, it improves the lives of the whole family. So 
I've given a lot of background and we can talk about this probably for a whole semester, as I said, but we want to give a kind of an applied example of how this focuses in agriculture and was specifically on a project that I've been working on called Next Gen Cassava, just to show how this all thinking can affect, especially the ag research for development work that we do. So the project I'll talk about is called Next Gen Cassava. Um, cassava is a staple crop in Africa. It's grown globally, but it's a food security crop, especially in Africa. It's known as the Rambo crop for, uh, for climate change because it's very resilient to drought and climate change generally. So it's really seen as an important crop, especially for smallholders in Africa. And the Next Gen Cassava project really focuses on cassava breeding. So developing new varieties of cassava for Sub-Saharan Africa. So how does gender or, or gender research really factor into plant breeding? They seem very distinct domains of research to one another. How do they intersect? Well, really the, the bottom line comes down to setting priorities. So if you look at preferences of farmers, men, women, in different areas of the same country even, those check preferences vary. And that varies based on technical, sociocultural context, modes of production and processing. There's a lot of variables. So the question is, if we're developing a new variety, who makes the decisions on what's prioritized? Who controls the gene flow? Who determines which genetic qualities are valued for which market, which purpose? Generally, these are the research programs that do this. So this new concept of, well, how do we develop varieties not just for environment, but for people? So usually in, in plant breeding, it's, it's defined as an environment that you target, but how do we start targeting social groups? And this can include women, this can include disadvantaged, marginalized migrant groups. So this is new thinking that's kind of coming forward. And an initiative I'm involved in that you may be interested to look up in the, the links along the bottom here is called the Gender and Breeding Initiative, where the CG has invested in really taking a step back at their animal and breeding programs and looking at the different steps involved in a plant breeding program to see how we can bring gender into each. So there's a lot of reports that are on that website that are coming up in the next couple months as well. So if you're interested, you can contact me or go to that link below. So what does this all have to do with cassava? Well, as I said, we already know, if you look at food crops specifically in Sub-Saharan Africa, we know, already know from a recent review last year basically that trait preferences follow gender divisions of labor and market access. And that's consistent across crops. Specifically, cassava is important because it's defined as a woman's crop. What does that mean? Women are very heavily involved in the production and processing and sale of, of cassava, which really means we need to take a closer look at gender analysis of the production processing and ensure that any new varieties, especially that we're developing, are gender equitable. Are we really thinking about women as we're designing the new varieties? And there's a history of looking at gender differentiated preferences for cassava. So what type of cassava do different people want or need? And there's documentation that that is different and that actually follows livelihood strategies. So for example, this study down here in 1998 showed that uh, widows in Malawi preferred a different type of cassava than married women because they were more likely to have their food stolen out of their fields. So they considered bitter varieties that not many people wanted that required longer processing times, but meant they wouldn't get their food stolen as much. So these things are very closely interlinked and we have to spend a little bit of time understanding these dynamics if we wanna be intentional in designing new breeds that really meet those needs. So the question really is, can gender research help set cassava breeding priorities? And this really wasn't considered at the start of the project and it's something we're exploring. So I'll show you a little bit of results and see where we've gone with that. So we do this work in two countries, Nigeria and Uganda. I'll start with Nigeria. We have a little more information there. And the reason why we focus on Nigeria is because it's by and large the largest cassava producer in the world. Cassava is consumed throughout the whole country. It's a major staple. People really can't go a day without consuming cassava. And the flip side is women also dominate cassava processing and sale. Men are more involved in the production end of things and also fresh fruit sales. So this is quite well documented. So what we're trying to understand is what are the trait preferences and their relative importance for men and women in two specific areas in the Southeast and Southwest where we work? And how does that help guide our breeding development? We use different methods, focus group discussions, interviews, individual interviews, and we had eight different sites. So just some 
brief results, basically. When you look at the picture, what was interesting to us is we separated the data both by region and by sex. So if you look at the southeast and southwest, these are the two first columns on the left in the middle. We have three different categories. We asked, do you sell fresh, do you process and sell, or do you consume at home? And what you see in the southwest is men mainly, and the, the asterisks indicate significance, so the men mainly significantly sell fresh roots on the market more than women. What that means is they'll harvest, sell the root directly. Women, it's exactly the reverse for women, they'll harvest the roots, process them into a product, and sell the product, so they add value. But by and large, home, home consumption is about, you know, 50 to 70 percent, and men cite that as, as a more of a source of cassava for their home is what they get from their own fields. Now the picture in the southeast is a little different. You don't have the same differences. The pattern by and large is the same. Some selling fresh, processing and selling, but there's a lot more home consumption. And if you look at overall, you see a difference between men and women, but I kept these disaggregated because you can see that the overall difference really comes from one region and not the other. So what that tells you is it's not so simple. We can't say men do this, women do that all across Nigeria. It has really regional variability as well. And when we look at rankings, a lot of people do this in plant breeding. They ask groups of people to rank different varieties. What do you grow and why do you grow it? Tell us why you grow it. And what we saw was we, when we did a similar exercise, even though the same variety, the, the left-hand column is the names of varieties. These are the types of cassava people grow. And that the two columns are reasons that men give and women give. Without having to read all of this, what it basically says is even though men and women in separate groups will tell you they're going the same thing and rank those in the same importance, the reason for doing so is very different. So women often, often say product quality for the products that they produce. That's consistently in all of the responses. Men will mention things that are more agronomic about the growth of the crop. It matures early, it's tall, it suppresses weeds, it's good for intercropping. So even though they're mentioning the same things, the reasons are different, and those really follow the gender roles as we saw previously because women process into products, whereas men sell fresh. So it's kind of reinforcing what we know, but in greater depth and with a little bit more reasoning. And we back that up with a little more uh, frequencies and looking at more quantitative data and, and larger numbers of individuals. And what we see is the same picture. Basically, the two asterisks p-values here show that women mention cooking and processing quality more often than men. Men often agro uh, men mention agronomic characteristic characteristics more often than women. Again, this follows directly what we saw. Men are more involved in production and fresh sales, so agronomic characteristics are more important. Women process and sell and cook at home, so those are more important for them. But again, when we disaggregate our region, you see differences again. So it's not as simple as saying men do this, women do that. Within each region's regions, there are also very different differences. For example, southeast, there's more home consumption. So women mention fast cooking, for example, which wasn't even mentioned in the southwest. So in summary, what we realize is, not that surprisingly, household use and role of women in production and processing, really the traits follow these trends. And these trends really follow cultural and historical significance of cassava, which is different in the Southeast and the Southwest. In the Southeast, traditionally, women are more empowered, quote unquote, according to some studies. And they have a longer history of cassava production and processing. And the ranking of varieties, we, we raised a flag that this needs to be done a little more carefully in looking at the underlying drivers and not just the final ranks. But what we really draw attention to is we can't just differ by sex and say men and women do this, but region is also very important. And what we saw actually for seed source is that religion has a huge factor in determining how people access seed source. I didn't show that result, but it's very interesting based on your religion, how you access different seed sources. And a little bit of to say on Uganda, the work that we did very, very quickly. Um, cassava is not a big staple in Uganda as it is in Nigeria. Um, after matoke and sorghum and maize, it's another staple. But matoke is by and large the largest staple. It's a cooking banana. It's consumed, cassava interestingly, is consumed in different forms in Uganda. Um, Nigeria, it's, it's quite uniform. For example, in the north and northwest, due to migration, it's usually con consumed as flour. So flour is made from it, and then it's mixed with water and turned into kind of a paste. 
that's used with a soup. Whereas the rest of the country, it's boiled. The root is directly boiled and consumed that way. So in the Northwest, we discovered this unique processing method called heat fermentation, which is how flour is made in that particular region. And the reason why women, again, are the ones doing a lot of this flour production, and when we ask them why they do this specific type of fermentation, they say the fer we ferment cassava because it's our culture to ferment. And when we process it, we do it because our parents did it. So it's a really, it's a handed down behavior, a way of consuming cassava that's kind of been retained in that particular area. And interestingly, when we looked and asked about which varieties are best for that particular type of consumption, the land races, so these are varieties that have been growing in that area for many decades, and not the newer ones were more preferable because they had very particular characteristics that suited that use. And when we looked at men and women to see if there were differences, there were. Women often cited white color and texture, for example, of the root. It's really important. Where men, men mentioned water holding capacity. But by and large, they were very similar. So in summary, women play a key role in processing in, in flour, processing into flour, especially in the Northwest. And this really follows a cultural tradition. And what we want to do for the breeding program there is start understanding this process a little better so we can design varieties to meet that specific use. And even though men and women have largely overlapping preferences, there's some variability and we need to measure and see if that's important for our breeding programs. And what we thought was most interesting is the land races are very suited for the exact use that they're grown in, which is not surprising, but we can use them as genetic material to improve the rest of the breeding lines for that specific use. <coughs> so in summary for next gen we have some next steps we just started our second phase and we're doing hopefully doing some interesting work starting this year what we want to do is scale out this thinking into 250 300 farmers per country and do large-scale participatory evaluation trials so this is asking a large number of farmers to evaluate different varieties what we want to do here is really work with farmers groups existing farmers groups in both countries specifically targeting women's groups, youth groups, migrant groups, so that we're very diversified in the type of farmers that we work with in each country. We actually also want to do some action research to look at how within these groups our power relations determine. So even if you have a woman's group, for example, it may be that a woman with, a, with more power, more income, uh, more of a hierarchical power may actually wield more power over a poorer woman than her husband does over her. So how do the power relations within these groups actually work? And how are the norms, how, norms affecting that? And how does that affect our research process? So we're looking at our research process as we're doing it. And we want to know, you know, who makes decisions, why and how within these farmer groups as well. And we also want to do comparative study that we're working on as a potential student project and look at randomized control trials to measure the impact of gender on these evaluation outcomes. So if we have a, we're working with women in one area and not with women in a nearby area, how does that affect the outcomes? So kind of a comparative design that we want to see if we can measure differences. Um, with that, I'll hand over to Devin to talk about GREAT and then we'll open out to the discussion at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. Um, so the GREAT project really came out of NextGen, as Holly was just talking about it. Um, NextGen wasn't designed originally with the gender component, but they started looking more and more at the limitations they had within their project and figuring out how, how they could address those, and gender seemed like an obvious fit, and they're taking that further and further. And through NextGen, they ended up developing a pilot project, which led into GREAT and received funding from the same source, um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation which is exciting because it points to a new appreciation from the foundation for gender and broader in their agricultural profile. Um, so I'll go into a little bit about GREAT. Uh, next slide, please, Holly. Um, so uh, you heard it already once from Julie, but GREAT is a short acronym for a very long name, Gender Responsive Researchers Equipped for Agricultural Transformation. It's a five-year project. We just finished year two, so we have a few more to go. Um, and basically what it does is it takes a look at the agricultural research life cycle and we look at gender through every single phase of that research cycle and we train researchers from around sub-Saharan Africa along that research cycle in how to incorporate gender into it in a meaningful way. So it's not just, you know, add gender and mix, as Holly said. Um, and 
And we do a lot more than just trainings. Uh, it's, uh, we build communities of practice. We're building a community of practice. And um, we work with institutional transformation. But training really is the core of our program. It's because through projects like NextGen, we realize that, that a lot of agricultural researchers are simply not trained in gender. They don't have any concept of how to work with gender. And then someone along the way will say, oh, to get this project funded or to get this proposal accepted, you need to include gender. So people will throw it in and they'll check their box and consider it done. Um, so we were thinking if we want to really make a big impact in agricultural research, that we need to train, uh, train the next generation of researchers. We need to train people from across the continent um, and we need to do it in an interdisciplinary fashion. So next slide, please, Holly. Uh, and to look at the sustainability aspect of the project, we partner, so Cornell partners with Macareri, I know I'm butchering that name. Um, and it's a, one of the leading universities in Africa, it's in Kampala. Um, it's the largest, or the oldest, and I think largest university in Uganda, and consistently ranked one of the best in, on the continent. And they've got a great ag school and a school of women and gender studies. So it was a perfect fit. Um, and next slide, please, Holly. Um, and then we also partner with a lot of other organizations. Again, the Gates Foundation is our funder. But then we, we strategically partner with, with organizations across Africa that have their own strategic advantage that we can work with and leverage, um, including AWARE. Um, Align is our m and &E partner, IFPRI. Asareka works with us on institutional transformation around the continent with, with the institutions that host our, our participants. And Cultural Practice is an organization based in DC that works with us on developing our methodologies. Next slide, please. Um, so just to give a little more in-depth overview, the core of GREAT is our cohort-based trainings. And each one has a specific theme. Um, so for instance, our our first one was on uh, roots, tubers, and bananas. And again, that grew out of the cassava project. So it was a natural fit. This year, we just finished a cereal grains course. And this coming year, we'll be doing a legume breeding course. Um, we, again, we get participants from across Africa. Um, and actually, even some participants from outside of Africa, if they are working directly in projects on agricultural research, for development within Africa. So you'll see later a map that shows some participants coming from France and even Colombia. Um, but again, the focus is on the application of research for development in Africa. We also strategically target specific institutions and we, we accept applications from across the continent, but our goal is to try and get a critical mass because thinking that at the end of five years, if we train five researchers or two researchers from a whole smattering of different uh, institutions, and we don't work on how they can change the culture within their own institution, then our impact is really limited, and it's not very cost effective. Next slide, Holly. Um, we have four major objectives for the project. The first is that Makerere University, our partner in Uganda, um, will become a center of excellence for gender responsive research and training. And this is, uh, this is something that we're still identifying how this will take shape over time. Um, it's very, let's say, uh, adaptive. Um, but it's, it's exciting because what we want to do is we're looking towards having, a, say, a master's degree in gender responsive ag research. Um, and then objective two, this is related to our course. So what we do, this is about developing capacity within researchers in Africa. And again, that's the core of our program. Objective three is about the community of practice. And, and this builds on the course so that when we have people from, in each course, say eight or 10 countries coming together from different institutions and bonding, we want them to continue connecting and growing their own personal networks later. And this is still in development, but we've even seen so far just things like the fellows come together and form their own WhatsApp groups and start sharing ideas and proposals for projects um, and sharing resources. So it's happening organically, even as we're trying to develop a more substantive, uh, formal community of practice. And objective four uh, is really the institutional transformation. And for that, we're working not just from the bottom up with the fellows, but from the top down with our uh, institutional partner, Asareka, which works on agricultural research across East and Central Africa. Next slide, Holly. And again. 
So again, courses are the core of the great project. Um, some of what sets great apart from other short courses in ag, ag research and development uh, is the interdisciplinarity. We insist that participants come in interdisciplinary teams. What that means is that we bring together uh, biophysical scientists like plant breeders um, or plant pathologists and mix them with uh, social scientists such as uh, ag economists or sociologists and they attend the training together. So they, they all go through the same mixed methods applied research training. So if you're a social scientist, you have to learn something about breeding a bit. And if you're a quanti uh, biophysical scientist, you have to learn some about social sciences. And we'll get more on that in the next slide. Um, but for the second unique characteristic, we use a phased approach, which essentially means that we, we have two parts to the course separated by a practical field phase. So the first part, we go into gender theory. Um, and then we teach uh, gender theory and, and applied methods and research. And then they go out to the field for three or four months and they practice it. They practice it as that team of mixed methods researchers, some of whom haven't necessarily worked together before, even if they're coming from the same institute. And then they come back and we work on uh, analysis. So we, we look at how do you analyze mixed methods research and data. And, and then we really take that further and say, okay, how do you write that up? How do you, how do you put this in a project proposal? How do you do MLE for um, monitoring and evaluation for mixed methods research, et cetera? And then how do we scale that up? And then the fourth part, again, is the community of practice. It's saying that people aren't just coming for this training. We want them to come to learn, to grow together, and then to take this on and take on the, the role of being transformative forces within their institutions and across the continent. Um, next slide, Holly. So for interdisciplinarity, uh, how I mentioned we have biophysical scientists and social scientists attending the course together. Our goal really is not that the biophysical scientists will become sociologists or that the sociologists will become effective plant breeders. And we try pretty hard to reinforce that throughout the course, saying to them, you know, reminding them over and over again that we don't expect full proficiency in these things. What we do expect is that if you are a, a biophysical scientist, if you are writing a project proposal, you will know what gender means. You will know what it means to, to actually meaningfully incorporate it into a proposal. You will know what it means to actually go conduct field research in an effective mixed methods way. And that'll probably mean that you're not gonna be the one doing it. It'll probably mean that you'll have to hire someone, but you actually know what to hire, like what's who to hire and what to look for when you do. And the same is true for the social scientists. So the goal there is that everyone can better communicate together and that gender becomes something more meaningfully integrated. There was a quote uh, that I saw a few months ago talking about gender not being added into a project, but being embroidered into it. And that's the kind of thing we wanna see more of. So this, this interdisciplinary approach is something that we're really firm on. And I think it, it seems to have worked really well so far. Next, Tali. Course content. Uh, Basically what we do, we start with, with applied gender theory and we start with those mixed message research uh, methodologies. And we, in the first phase of the course, the first week, what we really do is try and impress upon people. We, we basically try and create that aha moment. Um, and we see it over and over again. We look at that biophysical scientist. We had, we had one from CRAD who came. He was a high level project manager, breeder, and he said he'd been to four or five gender trainings before and he was dismissive of everything for the first four or five days. And he kept grabbing the mic and you know, being cantankerous and making everyone's life miserable. And then finally on the fifth day, I think it was of the first week, he had that epiphany and he grabbed the mic in the middle of the session, stood up and just said, hey, I've been to so many of these over so many years and it finally made sense. Like this is, this is what I'm supposed to be getting, you know? And he actually, he ended up becoming one of our biggest advocates and he just successfully got an $8 million project funded from Gates with a strong gender component in it. Um, and beautifully enough, he included a lot of his great cohort people in with him, including some of the trainers he worked with um, and his mentor. So that's what we're really looking for in this, this course content and in how we structure our delivery. And, and the flow goes from, again, from, uh, from applied theory and, and methodologies 
to going out to the field and testing those out, and then coming back and figuring out what do you do next with all of this. Uh, next slide, Holly. Again, we have three parts. Uh, first week training, like I was just talking about. Second week, which, or sorry, second phase, which is going out to the field. That typically, we give about four months for that. So we provide mentor support while they're out in the field. Um, and they go out, collect data. They, they develop their field tools while they're still in the research tools, while they're still with us in week one with help of a mentor. Then they go out, they field test them uh, and adapt them as needed and then come back for week two where we really examine the data they have, look at how you analyze and write up mixed methods research results, uh, and then look at next steps for institutional transformation, et cetera. Next, Tali. This is another look at, at our three-part or three-phase approach. Um, and it, this flows through all the different steps. Um, and you can see in that first one, the self-realization, conceptual clarity, interdisciplinarity. That's what we try and get at with the example I gave of the researcher from CRAD. Um, really critically examining stereotypes, critically examining um, our assumptions that we make in research, and then giving them the tools to go out to the field and do something with that. Uh, next, Holly. So the arrow doesn't really show up here, but there's a blue arrow behind those dots going to the right. Um, we've had two training courses. We just finished our second one, uh, the theme two serials breeding. And we have three more coming up. Um, and so this is, it's one thing to say about GRADE is that this kind of curriculum, this kind of training, this kind of approach isn't really happening elsewhere. So our approach to this has been iterative um, and adaptive. So we don't see this as a fixed thing. What we've been doing is, is testing something out, seeing what worked, what didn't work, and adapting it. And originally we had, I think, 10 different courses planned for the five years. And we realized that that was just far too much and that we couldn't do the quality we needed. Um, and we were even considering things like blending the two course, the two first and second week part of our training into one, et cetera. And all this is to say that, that we see this five-year project as, as really testing and refining a concept so that we can have this proof of what, what works pretty well and go forward and, and start scaling up even further. Next, Holly. Uh, this is a sh just a map of where participants have come from for our first two cohorts. Um, as I mentioned before, we had someone from, uh, from Colombia and someone from France. Those are both CRAD researchers. And then we had people from West and East Africa and Madagascar. And we do accept, like I said, applications from anywhere as long as people are working in agricultural research for development. That's, in, that's engaged in Sub-Saharan Africa. But we also do prioritize certain countries. And that, again, is for institutional impact, for a critical mass so that we can start to change the culture um, within those countries. And some of those are Ghana, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, and Burundi. Um, and we'll have, after the next three cohorts, this map should be a little more full, but we would also hopefully be getting deeper into some of the countries that are already there. Next, Tali. So, so far, what have we learned? Um, in a 10-minute presentation, 15 minutes, it's hard to get into enough detail. We've learned a lot. Um, there's a lot of fun stuff. Uh, it's super interesting. Um, we've, we've gotten a lot of demand from a lot of different people. We get applications from a lot of people. We've had a lot of projects contact us and ask us if we can deliver this kind of training specifically for their project. Um, but one of the challenges we've seen is that this this kind of training is typically not budgeted for. Um, and that is sort of a chicken and egg situation that we're in, where the budget won't really come until either the donors demand it or, or a lot of people have been through a training like this and know what to ask for when they, when they write a proposal. Because they can't justify a pretty strong budget line for gender training if they don't value gender properly. Um, and so this is something that we're hoping we can stimulate more of. Um, through through uh, our community practice work, through presentations that we ask our fellow, that our fellows give when they go to conferences, through presentations that our training team gives, um, and and Holly and the other co PI Margaret Mangeni in Uganda, um, and we have we've had like I said a, a lot of adjustments to our course model, and we're continuing to look at this from a fairly flexible point of view. 
So for instance, uh, spinoff courses, um, we, we had another Gates project that wants to train teams from across Sub-Saharan Africa and they want to send us 15 teams to train. So we're looking at the idea of having spinoff courses for specific organizations that could help cut our costs down, make it more accessible and deal with some of the unplanning, uh, unplanned elements of budgeting. Um, and we also are looking at francophone demand. It's a huge issue. Uh, like I said, our, our partner organization that we, that we are fully integrated with, Makare, it's in Anglophone country, Uganda, and they're an Anglophone university. So how do we build up that capacity to deliver this kind of course model and the community practice and the institutional engagement within Francophone countries? Uh, we have had teams from, we've had several teams from Burundi already. We've had uh, at least one team from Benin, and we've had at least one team from Niger. But all those participants come and attend the course in English, which is definitely, it works, but it's, it's to their detriment, I think, at some point. So it's a future point we're looking at. Um, and more broadly speaking for the future, what we're largely looking at doing is, is how, do we, how do we navigate this new territory we're charting? It, there's not a roadmap. Um, we've learned a lot, and, and we're really excited about seeing what we can do from here. Um, but we don't really know, and, and we're, we're always looking for feedback on what we can do better. Um, the Center of Excellence at Macquarie, that is, uh, we're still trying to define what that's going to mean, um, but it's very exciting, and there's a lot of positive feedback, and there's a lot of critical mass building up at Macquarie. And we're actually not just looking at Macquarie as something where we can build up capacity there, but as we, as we engage and we see what they're doing in gender, we also recognize our own deficits here at Cornell, which is pretty fascinating and terrific. Um, so, so Holly's been working with, with uh, the dean and others at the School of Integrated Plant Sciences here in the College of Agriculture, and, and they're gonna do a gender audit of their school. And from there, see what they can do differently and better. Can they add courses? Can they make it an easier, a better environment for women grad students? Um, can they engage more with other institutions, et cetera? Um, so it's, I think one of the fun things about this project is that it's really challenged everyone in the project and the institutions involved to rethink their relationship with gender, not just the participants. Next, Ali. And as far as success, um, we've seen a lot of success actually, and this is more on an individual level so far, but we're only two years in. Um, Bonaventure was uh, one of our participants in our first course, and he summed it up beautifully. Uh, he, he's an entomologist, and he said, as such, he would be biased towards control the insects and the problem is solved, or bring in new material and the problem is solved. But now it's becoming more and more clear that I have to also withdraw from entomology, enter the household, and imagine that I'm making decisions with them. Then try to respond back to my recommendations and see which ones of them work and which ones of them don't. I don't think any of us could put it any more beautifully. I mean, and that's the, the kind of epiphany that we're looking for, combined with the, the real skills to actually do that and the relationships with social scientists, for instance, to know that he shouldn't necessarily be doing that all himself, but he should work with the right people. Next, Holly. And we'll just show a few quick images um, during, some, during our, our couple of the courses we've had already. Here's from a field day where we take participants out during week one to do a quick field test for the day working with farmer groups. Um, and next, Holly. From that same field day, uh, we have some participants, a local farmer in the middle, and then one of our trainers, uh, second from the right. Uh, and, and we bring in trainers from, a few trainers from around the world, and also largely most of our training staff is from Uganda. So we work to build the training capacity of our trainers too, so that this can eventually be more durable in the long run. Next, Holly. And yeah, there's just a fun shot of our participants happy at the end of the course. Um, so I think we're done with this part. Do you have any more to add, Holly? Uh, no, we can open up to questions. Um, and we, we don't have a lot of time for questions. So if any people need to leave, um, I, you can go ahead and do that. But if you wanna stay for a Q and A, um, we can pass the mic around or the ceiling mics are on. Does anybody have any questions?
Hi, uh, Hale, and uh, thanks for the nice presentation. I have a quick question relating to uh, the trace that uh, farmers seem to prefer that, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. All right. So I'm trying to reconcile two, uh, two things that I took from your example of uh, cassava. Mm -hmm. That uh, men and women seem to prefer different traits uh, from the same uh, crop. And secondly, that uh, men and women are involved at different stages of the value chain. Mm -hmm. that is, they're getting different functions from the crop. So my question is this, after you correct for the different uses that the person is having from the crop, that is, for example, a trader versus a farmer, self-consumption versus, uh, you know, a value addition, after you correct for those uses, how much difference remains that can be attributed purely just to sex between men and women? Yeah, um, uh, not much at all, actually. And I think that's a point that we make to the breeding programs is we don't expect them to breed a woman's cassava for the Southeast. You know, that's just impossible. But what we try to emphasize is think of all of the roles involved in that production and processing process in the whole value chain. So usually the agronomic traits are prioritized, right? So what we're trying to emphasize is it's not that simple. So I would say correcting for what you're saying, it's very, very little. So, it, you know, it, it's a household consumption of the same crop. Men and women consume the same product. So even if women make it, everyone consumes it. So in terms of consumption preferences, they're definitely very, there, there are differences regionally and for migrant groups, but between men and women living in very similar conditions from the same background, no, there's not a lot of difference. Um, we have a question from Carol and then we have one from Helga in the chat too. Okay. Again, going back, can you hear me all right? Yeah, very well. Um, I'm going back again to your to your study, uh, I was I was surprised that there was no attention to ethnicity. I, I thought uh -huh. maybe the religion issue might be a proxy for ethnicity. But yeah. I'm, uh, you know, crop preferences are are kind of symbolic of a particular ethnic group, at least in some areas. And I just yeah. Even yeah, we did look at that uh, in Nigeria. So we disaggregated by as much as variables as we collected. <laughs> so the only ones that really became significant were sex, religion, and region. So ethnicity, I don't know if it's by chance, but a lot of our respondents were either Igbo or Yoruba. So it was pretty uniform within our sample. So the few people that were not Igbo or Yoruba, there was some migrant effects. We're doing further work on migrant effects, like from Togo and Benin, um, where you see different preferences. So in terms of migrant effects, yes, but within our sample, the ethnicity was quite uniform. So we didn't see that same effect. That's where I think the regional differences are coming from actually, is the ethnicity. Uh, project funded by Gates called the Tarina project, which is Asia specific. And you may want to look at, uh, you know, gender sensitive tools which are used by women in particular, mm -hmm. because, you know, the kinds of tools which men use in agriculture versus what women use and how much labor, mm -hmm. you know, that's one project which the Gates is funding and it is actually headed by Dr. Pingali. So okay. To look at that. The second you. is, you know, in some of the USAID projects and a couple of other projects, uh, when we talk of institutional transformation, if you are looking at bringing major policy changes within the institution, then I think upfront you need to have some commitments in terms of personnel who are trained will be maintained in those programs. Number one, mm -hmm. number two is funding for continuation of some of the work which is done in training. Number three is, you know, how do you evaluate the institutional commitments towards the trainings which you have done? Let's say if you have trained mm -hmm. 10 people from Makareri, are they really going to be involved? Are they going to get support when they mm -hmm. go? You know, things like that, because institutional transformation is a really big, big challenge. Yeah. yeah and lives of trainees, that's quite different than institutional transformation. So many of the USAID projects, you know, they want to look at institutional transformation and that's not easy. Yeah, definitely agreed. Um, it's one of the reasons why it's a more minor objective because award is really filling that space in a big way right now. 
So Ward has really embarked on this institutional transformation idea for gender responsiveness. So we're coupling with them and kind of complementing their efforts, basically. KV. All right, we emptied the room. <laughs> you have a question from Helga. Should I unmute you, Helga, so you can ask? Yeah, sure. Hi, Helga. Oh, hi. Um, Holly, uh, thank you for um, a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was wondering about what you said about women increasingly becoming the farmers. I'm assuming that that mm -hmm. is partially at least um, a result of the male out migration into urban centers for labor. What about girls, you know, uh, mm -hmm. girls education increasingly leading to different aspirations. And if they remain in farming, they look at something different in agriculture, more of an entrepreneurial aspect, more of something that is uh, not the drudgery that they see from their mothers and grandmothers. And how does grade build that into the course? the change in demographics? That's a really good question. I mean, maybe Carol, you can supplement this too. I'm not, I, what I do know, there's a lot of emphasis on youth. So uh, that, like you said, that that's well recognized. It's not just enough to just say, we're gonna target men and women, that, that young, we're trying to get more young people involved in agriculture, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa through multitudes of projects. And one of the things is, yes, you know, higher tech, uh, more market oriented, less drudgery in production or, or general aspects that they're trying to build in. Between um, young men and young women um, within that demographic, I'm not sure the difference is. I know there's a lot less young women. Young men tend to do what, at least the research that we've done, what we've seen is young men do more work in the city. So the migration continues for the young men and the young women are by and large not involved because of land tenure as well. They don't usually get land inherited, especially when they're very young, they work on their mother's fields or their parents' fields, so they have less opportunity to develop their own farming business, for example. Um, within GREAT, I wouldn't say we explicitly address that, but what we do address is looking at cross-sectional factors. So what we emphasize over and over again is it's not just looking at men and women. Look at age, look at ethnicity, look at education status. And if you see that something else other than sex is really explaining a big variability that you're seeing or that's driving some changes that you need to be aware of, that's what you should focus on. So I think we're addressing it in that we're saying, we're, we're moving away from men versus women, but just saying, look at all you can look at, collect the information, analyze it, do your analysis, and then see what's really rising to the top and address that as an issue. I, I would just add um, this whole interest, recent interest in intersectionality is actually a wonderful Kind of framework with, with, within which to address that. I, I think there are too few people trying to address that mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. Um, I, I've been sort of struggling with the other end of that continuum with old people. I've, I've <laughs> studied in a community that is half old people. Yeah. Just wondering what on earth are the <laughs> for uh, from a gender perspective. So, so it's yeah. That's the, that's the next wave. <laughs> women, youth, and old people, which is <laughs> probably closer to the reality, right? With migration as well, you have kind of the missing generations and grandparents and children on farms, so. But isn't this all largely a factor of, of like, you know, men in their quote-unquote prime working years going to the high-paying jobs or the mm -hmm. higher work, um, and women missing out on those opportunities, older people not working anymore, being forced out, um, and youth not yet being able to take on those roles. Yeah, it's a perfect storm. <laughs> I think increasingly uh, you read these statistics that the um, increasing middle class in uh, sort of say the better off um, countries in Africa, such as Kenya, are investing in their rural homes. homes. Yeah. And, and I read statistics such as 20% off the land is already owned by such people who actually live mm. in the city, but increasingly um, farm, you know, as kind of a, a yeah, additional income and hobby. And they are the ones who are very interested in applying modern and improved technology. Mm -hmm. So how many are, of those are women? I couldn't, I couldn't get the statistics on that. 
That's interesting. Yeah. I've never thought of how many of those are. I know it's a trend, but mm -hmm. no one's disaggregated it maybe to. I don't think so. I haven't seen any figures. Hmm. That's a study. Right. <laughs> <laughs> any takers? <laughs> oh, Lucy wants to do it. Um, Lucy wants to do it. Lucy, tell us what you find. <laughs> No, it's so true though. Even the people, the researchers I work with at, at well, we, Nafri, Uganda, Nigeria, they do the same. They say, we, I'm going to retire into farming. I've already bought my land. I already know where I'm going to go. So. We have a, a woman professional here who has a farm um, in the country. She, grow, she raises sheep, right? If that's the person I think you're thinking. <laughs> Linda, tell us all, represent all women farmers globally. <laughs> <laughs> well, they say that there's, for instance, uh, money for women in farming in, in New York State to help, and, but it's never really um, materializes. That's my oh, experience. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, on that note. Um, <laughs> on that <laughs> um, all right, well, joining. thank you, everyone. Sorry. Oh, wait, question, sorry. Question. Like, I, I wanted to add that, that there is a, 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 a group in Thailand that is a, is a weekend farmer's group. Hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, well, I, I don't know whether, if there's 5,000 of them. There are a bunch of people that are going back from the city to the farm. And the ones I know personally are, are women. And they um, are going back to farm, and they also uh, grow rice, and then they they market it, and they're, they <laughs> they they invent their own tools and paint them pink. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> there is a, there is a group that you could study that uh, is, is doing a lot. <laughs> Randy wants to talk now. Weekend farmers. Uh, I just have. Uh, uh, one question, and that is, where does nutrition fit into this? Uh, I don't think of cassava as being something that you want to encourage people to eat more cassava. Is, <laughs> am I, or, am I, or is there something? What? The leaves are good, yeah. Listen, uh, the point is, uh, also, uh, are Francophone people have a different diet than Anglophone people? I would guess so, and, and the Thai people have a different diet too. But you need a nutritionist, because I don't know whether we should be encouraging people to eat more cassava or not. I'm not a cassava eater. I confess I don't like it so much either, but don't tell anyone I said that, Kanan. <laughs> I will go. I will, it won't go down well. It's not the tastiest or most nutritious thing. That's very true. <laughs> Thanks, Helga. Thanks, Holly. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Thanks, Carol, for coming. Sorry we couldn't have you reflect. We you were just the only one who volunteered, and we thought that would be a bit odd. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Nice seeing you all.